The definition of words tends to change over time, and the same word can be used in different contexts to mean different things. This is true of the word consciousness, where the term has different meanings in different fields and contexts. In modern parlance, consciousness commonly refers to the state of being awake and experiencing perceptions. This way of defining consciousness is especially useful in medical parlance, where we say that someone has lost consciousness when they have been knocked out or are under anesthesia. However, there are numerous philosophers who have defined consciousness differently and use it to refer to a very specific mental experience which isn't simply the conglomeration of all of our perceptions. The videos on this channel use consciousness to mean something very specific, which is why the claim that only humans are conscious or that consciousness evolved very recently sounds strange, paradoxical, and inaccurate. In attempting to clarify what I mean by consciousness, I have found it helpful to find terms that can be used in the place of consciousness in the modern sense. One term I have found is the word sentience, and this term can be used to refer to the modern definition of consciousness. Sentience can roughly be defined as the ability to have a subjective experience, and this term helps to clarify the word consciousness in certain contexts. Certain fields of psychology use consciousness to describe a feature of mentality which constitutes only a small part of our minds, and this often leads to confusion resulting from different understandings of the term. The explanation presented in this video will hopefully allow those who are interested in learning about these topics understand them more fully and with less confusion. We should note that language isn't subject to strict rules, and the definitions of words are often flexible for good reason. Furthermore, it would be wrong to insist that everybody adopt a certain way of speaking, and so the purpose of this video is rather to make the videos on this channel easier to understand and to make them more accessible to everybody. One of the most amazing features of language is its ability to specify ideas so that distinctions between specific concepts can be recognized, and this is one of the ways in which language expands our understanding of the world. For example, the distinction between the concept of evolution and the concept of natural selection allows us to see that these concepts are related but not synonymous. Evolution simply refers to a gradual change in the gene pool over time. Natural selection is a mechanism of evolution, whereby animals with advantageous traits are more likely to survive and pass on their genes. Evolution can also occur without natural selection, for example in the case of gene flow, and this distinction broadens our ideas about nature. By providing a distinction between consciousness and sentience, we may be able to obtain a more complete picture of the mind. The modern definition of consciousness is well captured by the philosopher Bertrand Russell, who wrote that, we are conscious of anything we perceive. By this definition, all things that we experience are a part of our consciousness, and consciousness can be explained as any form of subjective experience. This is also well explained by the philosopher J. Guan Kim, who writes, We are conscious at every moment of our waking lives. It is a ubiquitous and unsurprising feature of everyday experience, except when we are in deep sleep, in a coma, or otherwise well unconscious. When we speak of consciousness, this is what most people have in mind. However, two philosophers who are responsible for giving us the idea of consciousness, René Descartes and John Locke, had something else in mind when they conceived of consciousness. If we redefine consciousness according to Locke and Descartes' circumscription, and apply it to Russell's definition of consciousness, we can get a sense of what they meant by consciousness, and how it is different from the contemporary definition of consciousness. Russell's definition of consciousness is contained in the statement, We are conscious of anything we perceive. But right now, if you are seated while watching this video, you are perceiving the images on the screen, the sound of my voice, your feet touching the floor, your arms rested on the chair or desk, your skin touching your clothes, your tongue touching the roof of your mouth or your teeth, and you are also perceiving the temperature of the room, and yet you only became conscious of each of these things as I mentioned them. Indeed, much of what we perceive is not consciously noted, because our mind is usually busy elsewhere. It is also possible to be conscious of something without perceiving it. If you are in a familiar environment, such as your bedroom, you can become conscious of everything that is behind you without looking. These examples quickly show that there is indeed a distinction between perception and consciousness, and consciousness is more synonymous with awareness or knowingness. We can also be conscious of something in our minds without perceiving it with our sense organs. Whenever you ponder something or introspect, 
A series of words or images flashes through your mind, and your consciousness is occupied by this internal monologue. If you have ever found yourself daydreaming, perhaps in class or at work, your consciousness is busy pondering something, maybe trying to remember a funny joke, or recalling what you last watched on television, all while your sense organs continue to perceive the world. Consciousness, according to Locke, is an essential feature of our identity. Being conscious of yourself, i.e. of your own existence, is a distinguishing feature of modern humans. Self-consciousness also occurs when, for example, you are giving a presentation or a speech, as you become aware that others are paying attention to you, and this may cause you to become nervous. We can get a more complete sense of what is meant by consciousness using the following experiment. On the screen, focus the center of your visual field upon this red dot. If your eyes are focused on the dot, without moving your eyeballs, you will see yellow dots in the corners of your peripheral vision. Notice how you can see these dots despite focusing on the red dot in the center. But also note how your consciousness can focus on each of the dots independently, without moving your eyes to look at them. In other words, you can become conscious of things in your peripheral vision without looking at them directly, as we use our minds to probe the contents in the full field of our vision. While your eyes are fixed in the center, your consciousness can move around and look at various elements in the periphery. Again, this shows that consciousness and perception are distinct from one another. The concept of consciousness in this sense also becomes apparent when we think about the uses of consciousness and where it is actually a hindrance. We have discussed this before, but I mention it again because it is a good example. People who can play an instrument, a sport, or do any talent at a high level often do so without the aid of their consciousness, as these skills become ingrained in their muscle memory. A highly skilled piano player doesn't need to be conscious of everything they are doing while playing the piano. In fact, if they become conscious of themselves, there is a good chance that they will end up making a mistake. The same applies when playing a sport wherein becoming conscious of the fact that you are playing may actually cause you to lose your focus and potentially make a mistake. Highly skilled athletes often describe how they must let go of their minds in order to perform well, and how thinking about what they are doing may cause them to mess up. All of this demonstrates that consciousness makes up only a small part of our mentality, most of which occurs unconsciously or subconsciously. In this sense, we are not conscious of everything we perceive, and sometimes, we aren't conscious of what we perceive at all. Julian Jaynes developed a useful analogy of consciousness as being similar to a flashlight in a dark room. It is like asking a flashlight in a dark room to search around for something that does not have any light shining upon it. The flashlight, since there is light in whatever direction it turns, would have to conclude that there is light everywhere. And so consciousness can seem to pervade all mentality when actually it does not. The philosopher Ned Block was one of the first to recognize that the word consciousness had gradually shifted in definition and that there was a distinction between two different types of consciousness. In a paper titled On a Confusion About the Function of Consciousness, Bloch formalized the distinction between what he called phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness. Phenomenal or p-consciousness simply refers to everything we perceive, raw subjective experience, and this is the same as Bertrand Russell's definition of consciousness as well as the idea of consciousness, which most people imagine when they hear the word consciousness. Access consciousness, or A consciousness, is what we have been talking about so far, the type of consciousness that is referred to in Freudian, Jungian, and Jainsian psychological models, and it refers to what is introspectable, and that which we can hold in our minds. In the scheme presented in this video, phenomenal consciousness is exactly the same as sentience, and for the rest of this video, we will be using the term sentience instead of p-consciousness. The question then becomes, what is sentience? Sentience simply refers to any sort of subjective experience that feels like something. In a now famous paper titled, What is it like to be a bat? The philosopher Thomas Nagel argued that an organism is sentient if it feels like something to be that organism. Nagel used the word consciousness, but the word sentience may have been more appropriate. Another philosopher, Peter Godfrey Smith, took up a related line of inquiry, and in attempting to understand the mental lives of animals, he derived the following insight. Subjective experience is the most basic phenomenon that needs explaining, the fact that life feels like something to us. People sometimes now refer to this as explaining consciousness. They take subjective experience and consciousness to be the same thing. Instead, 
I see consciousness as one form of subjective experience, not the only form. For an example that motivates this distinction, take the case of pain. I wonder whether squid feel pain, and whether lobsters and bees do. I take this question to mean, does damage feel like anything to a squid? Does it feel bad to them? This question would now often be expressed by asking whether squid are conscious. That always sounds misleading to me, as if it was asking too much of the squid. To use an older term, if it feels like something to be a squid or octopus, then these are sentient beings. Sentience comes before consciousness. We can wrap our minds around the concept of sentience by pondering where it does and doesn't exist. Are bacteria sentient? Or in other words, does it feel like something to be a bacteria? If we are being intellectually honest, we simply don't know, but we can speculate based on the fact that bacteria don't have any sort of nervous system. Bacteria do respond to their environment in a way that might make them appear to be sentient, but these could just be automatic responses that occur without any sort of subjective experience, and so it doesn't feel like something to be a bacteria. What about a tree? Again, since trees lack a nervous system, it is hard to conceive of trees being sentient. What about an earthworm? This is where things become complicated. If you step on an earthworm, it responds in a way that indicates that it feels pain, and so it seems that worms are in fact sentient. But it is also possible that this is an automated response, and it is hard to tell whether they are truly sentient. What about a mouse? Mice are sentient, because it probably feels like something to be a mouse. Mice can experience sensations, and its behavior is not simply governed by automatic responses. Humans are also sentient, because it feels like something to be a person. A philosophical zombie is a hypothetical person who is behaviorally indistinguishable from a person but has no subjective experience, and hence lacks sentience. You, in watching this video, are having a subjective experience of colors and sounds. Young children are also sentient, because they can experience pain, pleasure, and raw sensations. But as we have mentioned before, young children don't seem to be conscious, at least until they reach an age where they suddenly realize that they exist. Here is another thought that might intrigue some of you. Does it feel like something to be a computer? Probably not yet. But sometime in the future, we might be able to create artificial brains that experience sentience. The phenomenon of sentience is very mysterious, and philosophers and scientists don't really know what it is. Furthermore, it is hard for us to tell which organisms are sentient and which aren't. Sentience is the ability to experience qualia, a word which refers to raw sensations that feel like something. Examples of qualia include pain, experiencing color, the sensation of touch, and our sense of smell. Each of these have a subjective quality that produces a specific sensation. It feels like something to observe the color green, and looking at a green object produces the experience of seeing green. There are many qualia which humans can experience, and animals presumably experience their own unique qualia based on the sense organs they have evolved. These sensations, however, are different from consciousness, which refers to a mental awareness which is superimposed onto our perceptions. Consciousness and sentience should not be thought of as distinct or as opposing concepts. Sentience refers to a wide range of phenomena, of which consciousness is but a small part. Consciousness is just one form of sentience, because of the fact that consciousness feels like something. Recently, the word sentience has also started to take on different definitions, sometimes being used to refer to the state of self-awareness characteristic of human intelligence. We may, for instance, speculate about the existence of sentient aliens, by which is meant that these aliens are self-aware and intelligent. Of course, this isn't a problem so long as the context allows us to understand what is meant by the term. Language is a powerful tool, which enables our minds to access difficult concepts, but confusions can arise if people hold differing definitions of the same words. Thus, I have always found it helpful to clarify what is meant by certain terms, so that we may effectively communicate our ideas with minimal confusion.